Today we will do an exercise about full load hours and capacity factor. Just a short repetition. The full load hours is the actual electrical energy generation during a rear divided by the installed nominal power capacity. For example, if a generating unit runs at full power, at full load nominal power during the whole year, it would have 24 hours times 365 days. That's equivalent to 8,760 full load hours. You can do it also more precisely because a year has exactly 365.25 days. So this would be equivalent to 8,766 hours. Quite related to that is the so-called capacity factor, CF. So that's the ratio of the actual annual electricity output to the maximum possible energy generation output over a year. This would be your task. First, we calculate the capacity factor and the full load hours for biomass on the top left, then for wind power on the top right, then for photovoltaic energy below in the left and for hydropower for the year 2015 in Germany. Let's start with the biomass energy. So we first want to know uh, the full load hours. So we need to know first what's installed capacity. This kind of graph may be something misleading. So we take a look at the legend here. It says here for the installed generation capacity, uh, that's a green line. The green line you find up here, the equivalent unit to that is the installed capacity in million kilowatt. So this is 7.2 million kilowatt. That is equivalent to 7.2 gigawatt. That's a nominal installed capacity. Now we want to know the actual generated electricity. You find on the left side here, that's the electricity in billion kilowatt hours. If you take a look at that, that's you find a number of 50.3 billion kilowatt hour. So, Let's do the calculations. We already know from the table. So we know full load hours times the generation capacity is the actual generated electricity or the other way around full load hours is equivalent to actual generated electricity divided by the nominal generation capacity. Let's put in the numbers. So we have a 50.5 terawatt hour. That's equivalent to 50.5 times 10 to a power of 12 watt hours divided by the generation capacity. That's 7.2 gigawatts. That's equivalent to 7.2 times to a power of nine watts. And that is 7,014 hours, the number of full load hours. Let's come to the capacity factor. That's the actual electricity generated divided by the theoretical generation if the power plant would run on full power during the whole year. Let's put in the numbers. So actual generated electricity is 50.5 terawatt hours divided by the theoretical generation. That is the nominal power cap generation capacity 7.2 gigawatts times 24 hours times 365.25 not three, five, two, five hours. And that's equivalent to 0 0.8. So you have a capacity factor of 0 0.8. That's quite good capacity factor. If you will see, if you come to wind and solar power, this capacity factor will be much less. Let's take a look at wind power. So we have here the same table for wind power. Let's go to 2015 and we find here the installed generation capacity in the year 2015 was 44.5 million kilowatt and that is equivalent to 44.5 gigawatts. The generated electricity during 2015 is 79.2 billion kilowatt hours and that's equivalent to 79.2 terawatt hours. So let's take a look at the full load hours. The full load hours is a generated electricity divided by the generation capacity. 
let's put in the numbers, 79.2 terawatt hours divided by 44.5 gigawatt and we find the number of 1780 hours. The capacity factor is the actual electricity generated by the theoretical generation. Let's put in the numbers and then you find here that the capacity factor is 0 0.2. So much less, four times less than the one for biomass energy. This is, depends on the site. Germany is not a very good wind country. So if you go to Scotland or Ireland there, the wind is more constant and you will find higher capacity factor in the vicinity of 0 0.4 up to 0 0.5. Let's take a look at solar power. So we have the photovoltaic energy during 2015. The installed generation capacity is 39.8 gigawatt and it generated only 38.7 terawatt hours. So already by these numbers you will find that the number of full load hours will be in the vicinity of about 1000 hours. Let's calculate it more exactly. Let's put in the numbers for the full load hours, actual generated electricity divided by the generation capacity. This is then 972.3 hours. The capacity factor is the actual electricity being generated divided by the theoretical generation. Let's put in the numbers and you find a capacity factor of 0.11 only. So that's not very good. Germany is not a very sunny country. If you go to Southern Europe, you will have a capacity factor in the vicinity of 0.2 in the desert. So when you will find a capacity factor in the vicinity of 0.25. Last but not least, hydropower. So we have here uh, installed capacity of only 5.6 gigawatt and a generation of 19 terawatt hour. So that's not only stored hydropower, it's also flowing river hydropower. So the capacity factor is not one, much less. We we'll take a look at that now. So these are the numbers. So the full load hours are 3,393 hours. Then we have the capacity factor of 0 0.387. So we come to the second part of the exercise or exercise two. First, let's do a repetition because we need it. It's the specific heat or sometimes we use the word heat capacity. The specific heat or specific heat capacity or sometimes you hear the word thermal capacity, small letter C. Unit is Joule per gram Kelvin. It's the amount of heat or heat energy required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of matter by one Kelvin. The relationship between the heat Q and the temperature change delta T is, so we have here the Q is equal to C times delta T times M, the mass of the matter you want to heat. The relationship does not apply if a phase change is encountered. We discuss that later because the heat added or removed during a phase change does not change the temperature. To give you some examples of specific heat, air has a specific heat of one joule per gram Kelvin. Of water, specific heat is 4.18 joule per gram Kelvin. So ready now to do the exercise. The question is, how much energy do you need to heat one liter of water from 14 degrees Celsius, that's groundwater temperature, to the boiling point at sea level? The boiling point at sea level is 100 degrees Celsius. This is our formula. So just let's put in the numbers, specific heat, of water we learned before 4.18 joule per gram kelvin the temperature difference is 100 minus 14 kelvin 
one liter of water weights one kilogram or 1000 grams. We call it Q1 because it's the first part of the exercise. The solution is 359.5 kilojoule. Next question is vaporize one liter of water from boiling point at sea level. This formula doesn't apply then because at the evaporation point we don't have any rise in temperature. It's a phase change. How we deal with that? Let's do some theory. So we have here the phase change required heat to melt ice for example and go into water. This temperature stays the same but for sure you need energy. And this energy or the heat energy is Q is equal to Lf times M and the constant is 334 joule per gram for water. There's another phase change from liquid to steam or to gases. This is called QV for evaporation and we stay at the temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. So we have liquid and gases. So the formula is Q is equal to LV times M and the constant LV is 2260 joule per gram for water. If you compare those numbers you see that it needs much more energy to evaporate water at 100 degrees Celsius rather than to melt ice. Okay, let's apply this. So the question was how much energy do you need to vaporize one liter of water from boiling point at sea level? So this 100 degrees Celsius. So the vaporized formula is applied. So we have QV is equal to LV times M and the constant LV is 2260 joule per gram. To put in the numbers we have then 2260 kilojoule or 2.26 megajoule. If you want to melt one kilogram of ice at the temperature of zero degrees Celsius, the formula is QF is LF times M and LF is 334 joule per gram and you come to a number of 334 kilojoule. So now I calculate all the energy requirement for that. Now we want to see what is needed in terms of fuels in order to perform that. We use natural gas as a fuel and hydrogen as a fuel. The so-called lower heating value for methane or natural gas is 50 kilojoule per gram. For hydrogen is 120 kilojoule per gram. So as you know from the first part the required energy we have to supply is 359.5 kilojoule. So we apply this. So we have here the mass of the fuel times the lower heating value times the efficiency of our burner. It's not 100% because you lose some, if you burn something, uh, the outgoing temperature of the fumes have also a temperature. You cannot have a efficiency of 100%, but quite good here it's 90%. So we have a factor of 0 0.9 here. So we have here the weight of the fuel we need is M1 because it's the first part of the exercise here. Q1 divided by lower heating values times eta of heat. We put in the numbers. So we have here 359.5 kilojoule divided by 45 kilojoule per gram. It's 7.99 gram. For hydrogen we have a much higher lower heating value. So we only require 3.33 gram to perform that. So now we want to vaporize one liter of water. The lower heating values are the same. So you can also say net heating value. 
because you have a higher be heating value. This describes the uh, chemical energy inside a fuel, but it's not available because, for example, you have humidity inside your fuel and this has to be vaporized by the fuel itself and therefore the net value of the heating value is less. But here we have the values already given. You don't have to consider that. So we have 50 kilojoule per gram for methane and 120 kilojoule per gram for hydrogen. The required heat we have to produce is 2.26 megajoule. Come here, see below the formula. Here the mass is the required heating, the required heat energy divided by a lower heating value times the efficiency of the burner. That's equivalent to 2260 kilojoule divided by 45 kilojoule per gram. So we have 50.22 grams. The same for hydrogen. We have 2260 kilojoule divided by 108 kilojoule per gram. That's 20.93 gram. Last but not least, we have the melting of the ice. Also one kilogram, same efficiency of the burner with 0 0.9. And we have to produce 334 kilojoule only. So the formula is pretty much the same. So we just have another index instead of V, we have now F. And if we apply the numbers, we have 334 kilojoule divided by 45 kilojoule per gram. This 45 kilojoule per gram is the lower heating value of gas of 50 kilojoule per gram times the efficiency of the whole heating process or the efficiency of the burner. This is 0 0.9. So 50 times 0 0.9 is 45 kilojoule per gram. In the end, we need 7.42 grams of natural gas or methane. Very last, if we have hydrogen, the lower heating value is much higher and we have 334 divided by 108 kilojoule per gram. That's 3.09 gram. Thank you very much.